And welcome to the session, Research and Innovation Evidence, the Ingredient for Better Policy Making. And I'd like to welcome not to those of you just in the room, but also of you, those who are looking at the live streaming event online. As I said, the Impact Awards Ceremony will take place directly after this session. And during this session, you can also provide feedback through questions using the Slido app. It's actually, you'll find it under the policy sessions on the conference app here. I think what all of us accept is that there is a wealth of information which is both qualitative and quantitative from both European and national funding programs. And in fact, if we look, and I mean, I think this is an appropriate point, if we look at the letter from Ursula von der Leyen, the new president, part of it states, Europe must lead the transition to a healthy planet and a new di digital world. But it can only do so by bringing people together and upgrading our unique social market economy to fit today's ambitions. And more specifically, Within her letter to the new Commissioner for Innovation and Youth, Maria Gabriel, there is a very clear focus on the European research area itself. We all, as researchers, as policymakers, and various other groupings in this room, all accept these things. We accept very well that um, evidence should inform policy, and policy should be able to look at past evidence, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, to inform to see if that policy has been successful. However, a lot of the time we're talking to one another, and who we really want to talk to are those outside, our citizens and our politicians. We say that research and investing in research is a good thing, and by and large that is accepted. But if you look at the overall budget of the European Commission, for example, the actual portion devoted to research is rather small. We all try to increase that, and therefore we need to communicate better how that investment in research can have significant impact on both our economy and our society. And most importantly, we must communicate beyond our politicians and policymakers to our citizens the same things, to engage them. And this is, in fact, one of the things that, one of the themes of, this, of, of, of these particular days, which I think has been really stimulating. Today in this session, we're going to hear from a number of people, both at European and national level, who have a great deal of experience in this area. And I'm delighted, in fact, to, I want to introduce all of our panel members first. And first, in our left, on my left here, is Fulvio Esposito. Fulvio is Professor of Parasitology at the University of Camerino. And currently, he is also head of the technical section in the Italian Ministry for Education, Universities and Research. And I think that's really important because Fulvio straddles two different sections. He straddles the political, the ministerial side, but also the scientific side. And of course, Fulvio has been deeply involved in the development of European policy, especially on researchers' careers and on the European research area itself. Immediately to Fulvio's left, I'm really delighted as well, that we have Janusz Potocznik, who is, now he is currently the chair of the UN International Resource Panel, which is a science policy interface in the area of resource management. But of course, you all know, or I'm sure you all know, that he himself was commissioner for research and indeed commissioner for the environment here in Brussels for, for a good number of years. So he's been intimately involved in the development of European policy, era policy, and the framework programs. Beside Fulvio is Anna Panagopoulou, who is currently director of the Common Implementation Center within the European Commission in DG Research and Innovation. And this is the one that designs the strategy and provides the framework for coherent and simplified implementation 
of the research and innovation programs, which is critical because remember, when you're looking at implementation of programs, you're looking at how you gather evidence and how you gather information that can be then used and fed into policy and informed by policy. Besides Anna is Richard Blundell from the Malta Council for Science and Technology. And he is, Richard is responsible for a number of different areas, but in particular, open science and innovation. And he's also an Iraq de delegate on the European Research Area Committee. Our last panelist is Cecilia Cabello Valdez, who's, who is a director at the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology, CECIT. And Cecilia has experience in a very broad number of areas including indicators, policy monitoring, scientific innovation. And Cecilia I know for many years myself because she's been a member of the steering group on human resource and mobility and indeed she was also, um, she is also currently the chair of that committee in Iraq. So I think we've got a pretty good group of, um, of experts here at the top table. Now we're going to kick off by I'm going to ask Fulvio to come up and give us his thoughts, his reflections on this whole area of evidence-based policy. So Fulvio, the floor is yours. Good morning everybody, <coughs> dear colleagues and friends. I would like to thank the organizer first for the invitation of course, but then and especially for having obliged me to look critically into a subject on which we, as researchers, we have some preformed concepts. One of these concepts is to consider as self-evident the fact that scientific <coughs> evidence uh, is an ingredient and possibly the most important ingredient for better policy making. <clears throat> Today, I will try to show you that rather than plainly, uh, plainly assuming the importance to design and implement policies and practices on the basis of scientific evidence, we, the researchers, we should still make an effort to demonstrate to what extent and under which conditions policy design and implementation should be based on scientific evidence. EBPM, evidence-based policy making, I will use the acronym for the sake of time, can be defined as a set of methods focused on the process of policy making rather than on the objectives of the policy, which are set and are the, responsi the responsibility of the policy maker. EBPM is founded on the assumption, which frankly speaking, is not yet supported by a wealth of data. The assumption that a policy based on systematic evidence produces better outcomes. Although using evidence to inform policy is not a new idea, it became popular even among the, the general public, relatively recent, recently. At the end of the 90s, when Tony Blair was chairing the UK government, the idea was to replace the ideologically driven poli politics with rational decision making, focusing the choices only on what works. This was the key word what works. The Blair administration established the what works centers and several success stories came out of this approach. Indeed, the arguments of the supporters of EBPM are strong and convincing. EBPM would improve citizens' trust in the government, citizens' life and well-being, quality and effectiveness of public spending. Overall, EBPM would improve the impact of policies and practices. 
Considering all these favorable outcomes of EBPM, one could wonder then why is not yet universally widespread and practiced. Possibly one reason is because it's not yet completely clear how to pick up among the multitude of data around us the good ones and decide what works in an unbiased manner, exempt from prejudices, from prejudices, ideology, and conflicts of interest. So we don't, we don't need just evidence, but trustable evidence. In other words, scientific evidence, or better and precisely, evidences resulting from a systematic research process. Instead, since EBPM has become so popular and fashionable, we assist now to a downward pressure so that almost everything qualifies as evidence. And programs which are based on reliable and strong evidence and effectively improve people's lives get mixed up with much less solid and effective programs. The message that I would like to pass to you is that what really matters is the quality of the evidence used as support of policy making. The EBPM label should not be used to dignify any sort of political decision just because it is based on some data or study or analysis. Researchers have an answer to these potential weaknesses, and the answer is the randomized control trial. The most, or accordingly to some scientists, the only reliable method to demonstrate a cause-effect relationship. However, when one deals with measures aimed at facing societal challenges within the let me say, the messy human society, outside the aseptic lab and its simple experimental models, the randomized control trials have limitations. One, and perhaps the first, is the transferability of findings from the trials groups to, the, to larger populations and in other geographical areas. An intervention which proved to be effective in Finland will not necessarily produce positive results in Italy, and vice versa, of course. And different outcomes could be observed even among regions of the same country, as it has been frequently observed in the US. Another obstacle limiting the feasibility of a truly scientific approach to policy making is represented by the incompatible time frames between policy making and research. The time frame of policy making may be dictated by objective emergency, emergencies like an epidemic, for instance, or by subjective emergencies like a political election, or even simply a press conference while research has its own time frame, which usually cannot be compressed to become compatible with that of, of policy making. Furthermore, while for established policy fields, for instance, public health, we may count on consolidated bodies of scientific evidence, this is not the case for emerging fields, like digitalization, the nanobiotech, or artificial intelligence. Finally, we cannot ignore another important practical constraint. Let's assume that our governments are sincere, sincerely interested in detecting what really works and intend to assess it, making use of the best possible scientific evidence. However, despite their genuine goodwill, they can't afford 
to be judged by their citizens as wasting money. And I think it happened to all of us to read or listen or watch to headlines in the media as the government wasted, wasted millions on a program ultimately found to be ineffective. In so doing, the media, and in consequence, the public opinion, overlook the fact that implementing an untested program could waste not millions, but billions of euros or dollars or pounds. This is the best demonstration of the need to involve, since the beginning, the citizens in research. The famous citizen science is the only effective medicine against this disease. Let me now touch a last aspect of our theme for discussion. We, the researchers, sometimes criticize the, well, often criticize the politicians because they are guided in their decisions by many criteria but scientific evidence. But looking from their point of view, is our own responsibility to provide them with robust and reproducible scientific evidence. Frankly speaking, we should admit that this is not always the case. We are aware and worried that sometimes scientific evidence is sold to policymakers well before it is solidly scientific and is not yet so evident. We know the problem of overselling and overpromising, and we should decidedly tackle these attitudes. A well-known and particularly worrying case is that of clinical trials data. Although published in top journals, only 10 to 25 percent of the result of the clinical trials proved to be, proved to be reproducible. And in the more complex realm of social sciences, the situation could be even worse. So the combined prerequisite for a truly evidence-based policy making is that researchers provide reliable data and that policy makers use this data. But the complexity of the issue requires additional considerations. We should be aware that over-relying on data and metrics and moving the decision level too far away from people who really know the matter may lead to overlook potential pitfalls. A good historical example is that of cobra snakes in Delhi. During the British colonial rule of India, the UK government was worried about the high number of cobra snakes in Delhi. As a policy measure, a reward was introduced for all dead snakes brought to the authorities. But an unforeseen and unwanted consequence of this measure was that Delhi citizens started breeding cobra snakes to bring to the British officials. The net result of the policy intervention was that at the end, the snake problem in town was worse than before. Literature is full of these kind of examples. So another prerequisite for successful policy making is an anticipatory analysis of possible unwanted side effects. But please, don't conclude from the snake's example that the history of EBPM is an history of failures. It's not so. To quote just one important example of success, in Tanzania, the array of policy measures informed by the results of household disease surveys has contributed to over 40% reductions in infant mortality. On this basis, we can conclude that optimal utilization of scientific evidence in policy making can help save lives, reduce poverty, and improve development and growth. 
In summary, EBPM can be the key for achieving the sustainable development goals and for a positive and visible impact or of our famous missions. In conclusion, it's fully legitimate to look for instruments allowing our policymakers to temper with reason the complexity of our societies. But the apparently simple, apparently simple question, what works, should not lead us to underestimate and even less to disdain other categories which influence policy making, like feelings, persuasions, traditions, and most important, a vision of the future that politicians, or at least the best among them, may have. Researchers who are genuinely interested in contributing to better policy and better societies shouldn't take an a priori anti-politics attitude. After all, quantum leaps of progress in science as well as in society are often brought about not only through rational refinement, but also through intuition, which is a gift of good scientists and of good policymakers. And here in this panel and in this room, we have excellent examples of both. Thanks. Thank you very much, Fulvio, for that um, enlightening introduction. What I'd like to do is to follow up on Fulvio's points with our panel. And first of all, I'm going to look to, the, look to the future, and I'm going to address this to Anna. And the new commission is setting ambitious goals for Europe, including addressing key societal challenges, the transition to a healthy planet, digital world. So how is this going to be integrated into the Next Horizon Europe program? And how do you in RTD, in research and innovation, value and understand how evidence-based policy is going to be used in that context? Can you hear me? Yes? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Connor, for this question. Actually, uh, thank you very much for your intervention as well. It was extremely interesting, and it makes me think about all the challenges that we have in the Euro Commission, European Commission, but also I'm sure that you, all of you, that you are in our research community, you have the same challenges in the member states. So how we can convince our uh, policymakers that they are not dealing with research and innovation, how we can convince them that what we do matters, what we do, it will be important for the policy objectives, for the societal challenges, how what we do will provide impact to the economy, to the economical and ecological transformation, how what we do could provide impact for our citizens. And I think this is what we will try to address through the new framework program, Horizon Europe, but also through the revitalization of the European research area policy, because we cannot do it alone at the central commission level through a research program without the support of the member states. What, what we have started to do already now in view of preparing the Horizon Europe program is to have a global vision. And the vision is that we want to contribute to the SDGs. So we start with a big vision, which is beyond research and innovation. It addresses the climate changes. It addresses the digital transformation. It addresses the societal needs, the first thing. Second, for the first time, and this is all about that, uh, this conference, RNI days, we discuss about strategic planning. We discuss about how we can co-design together with all of you, with the member states, with the stakeholders, but also with the citizens, the priorities for the next framework program. Concretely, what do we want to achieve? What will be the priorities that we'll put first in the first calls in order to be able to address the policy needs, the impact needs, the society needs. And this prioritization is extremely important because we have to make sure that what we put on the table as priorities and funding and money 
it will be expected from the other side whether the policy makers they want to see some new technology developments coming out from our research whether the society will expect to have some answers to their daily needs we have to think already now we have to put it in our programming and even more we have to be able to design the expected impact how we are going to measure the outcome of these programs and how we will be able to demonstrate what we have achieved and how it will be possible to provide the next step to those that are expecting to see our results, what we concretely can deliver for policy making. We have to take in our cycle, in our strategic planning, uh, in, uh, under consideration what are the next policy developments at European level so that we know that in a timeline we will be able to deliver an input to those policy uh, initiatives. And what we can do already now without waiting the new framework program is to see how we can utilize the outcome of the existing ones. The ones of FP7 that they are still ongoing, the ones of Horizon 2020 that they are producing their first results, either in the sense of data, data that we can deliver, data that we can share, data that they could be used for next research, either by use of data for analysis, for messages, for, for, out, uh, for uh, uh, inputs to policy making, for decision making, or either by merging those data with data coming from national authorities so that what we decide, what we analyze, goes beyond the pure outcome of our research program. And the next outcomes we have nowadays are the results, concrete results that we will be able to use, exploit, and demonstrate that they create impact for the society. So these are the two things that we are already starting to work upon. And I would like concretely to say three developments that we have done. First is the Horizon dashboard. Maybe uh, many of you, you know this, is an open platform where everybody can have access about the data, the indicators that have been defined under Horizon 2020 program, and they can use this data in order to decide simple things. First of all, what are the trends in the European research? What are the outcomes of the project? Where is most of the funding has been already devoted under Horizon 2020, where I could be more successful and I could create more impact if I apply for a call, or what we can see now already as outcomes, publications, patents for Horizon 2020, and where are the gaps. So these are things that can be already used for decision making, for further analysis. And then the next thing that we put uh, as a new initiative under Horizon 2020 is the pilot platform. Uh, it is the Horizon platform for results, where we ask stakeholders, beneficiaries uh, of Horizon program on their own initiative to advertise their projects. And not just to advertise the projects and the results, but to explain how the concrete results that they have achieved so far could bring an impact, an impact to the society, an impact to the technology, or whether they ask for some political support or whether they ask for some financial support and by whom. So today at 2.30 we are going to launch this platform officially and you are all invited to this launching event at the Innovation Hub to see how this platform could be useful to demonstrate impact but also to promote the exploitation of the results of our work. And finally, what we try to do already now uh, for the first time, we have the Impact Award, the award is going to be given uh, after the end of this session, as an important incentive to our researchers to look at exploitation and the market uptake of the results. Because up to now, and I think we have to be all honest about that, the main focus of the applicants was to be financed to do their research, and rightly so. Because without the European funding, we would have had much less opportunities for research and innovation in Europe. But this is a moment to focus also on what should be the impact. And we want to reward those people that they have already thought about impact and they try to push about impact that is already in the market or is it already used by societies. So that's my reply to your question. Thank you very, thank you very much, Anna. Um, Janis. 
I, I want to come to you and um, to some extent put you on the spot because um, in, in 2008 there was a European Commission report on scientific evidence for policy making and you in fact talked about bridging the gap in that uh, between science and policy for the benefit of all and you talked about how it was also a social, political and cultural issue. So my question to you is, you know, how far has the gap been bridged in the interim period from your point of view? Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, actually, everything what Anna was saying, uh, it's absolutely correct and that's everything what you should do. But unfortunately, the reality is not so simple. So. When you talk, maybe one of the, if I start with two statements, which I'm normally using uh, when I try to introduce the complexity of the thinking which is today out there. One of the statements is from the World Economic Forum, which is basically saying something like that. The challenge seems not to be one of inadequate scientific evidence anymore. Rather, it's the one of cooperation and implementation. Complexity and scale of these challenges requires new forms of collaboration and more systemic approaches. So I think it's absolutely essential that we look to the whole uh, chain of decision-making and impacts. One is science, where, of course, the facts are produced. Then you have the policy-making, where you need to uh, distinguish two levels. One is the level of professionals, all employees in DGs are actually interface to politicians. Another level is politicians. And uh, discussing with those two audiences, it's not exactly the same. And then finally, you have the society, which of course needs to understand, needs to feel what is the impact and why the things which the science is doing are so uh, terribly important. So if Maybe the best answer was already given where the problem lies, uh, was already given by, by the most famous scientist of all, that's Albert Einstein, who, when he was asked uh, why humanity was so intelligent that we were able to develop uh, atomic energy, but we were so stupid that we were not able to manage it and that we have actually used it against ourselves, his reply was, uh, that is simple, my friends. That's because politics is more difficult than physics. So that's pretty much where the problem lies. When this, in this interface, in this translation of those things, you need to be simple, you need to be punctual, you shouldn't sometimes expect too much of understanding in the first place uh, from policymakers and uh, it's really a, a magic of repetition and a lot, a lot of investment. So if I just give you an example, because I'm now working on uh, UN level, if I put myself in the science shoes and if I put myself in the policy shoes, we have a report which came from IPPC, so International Panel for Climate Change, which is UN-based. We have a report which came from IPBS biodiversity, UN-based. We have a report which came from the group which I'm co-chairing, that's International Resource Panel, we do with resource management. We recently released it. We have a report which is called... Uh, um, um, uh, then, uh, then we have this... Um, uh, another report on the environmental, how it's called, environmental outlook or something like that. Uh, which, so basically all of those summaries of different kind of fields, but if I would be policymaker, I would be minimum puzzled because uh, what I need is uh, consistency and a clear message in which direction I need to go. And uh, my immediate reaction when I was uh, sitting in UNEP was, please now when you have all the reports, I understand that each one of those bodies have different uh, governance and it's practically different, difficult to use them that they would produce the, the that they would coordinate. But but now when you have the reports, it's pretty easy. Take somebody should take a group of few people should take those and and make a summary on 20, 30 pages, which would be a kind of a real uh, uh, real message, real message of critical views of science, which cannot be disregarded by policymakers. 
which would be on their table as a kind of thing which simply they cannot disregard. And those things are uh, relatively simple, but you, you have to think it from the point of view of the user which is following uh, what, uh, what you are doing. So if I go to uh, experiences which I've had, so maybe one thing before, which I have learned from uh, all the colleagues, uh, because we are called science policy interface, and that's exactly what is the debate today. And uh, sometimes what I do see as a problem is that the complexity of the models, which are the ultimate knowledge which we are using for estimating the future, it's sometimes in a way limiting us uh, because it's so difficult to, to take via the modeling the whole complexity of the system change which we have to embrace. And uh, that's why we sometimes, with too limited approach, come to the conclusions which are actually not exactly the conclusions which you would do if you would just logically follow uh, some, some of the ways of thinking. Uh, finally, if I go to the European Commission, I think, and, and also the experiences of uh, the work which I've had in the European Commission, if there was one thing which I really missed in all 10 years, it was more sincere and serious strategic debate. So we have been really too much silos focused and uh, discussing problems which were all in all, each one important. And I think the exercise which you have done in preparing now the new uh, horizon, I think it was a really good exercise. I think it's finally that somebody went so broadly and uh, introduced so much of uh, discussions, inputs into that. And uh, because what is essential for the Commission in the first place is understanding the reality. And that's not exactly uh, what is understood. So if I tr try to use... Uh, I think the best was explained by friends from Club of Rome, which basically said the humanity <coughs> has moved from so-called empty world, which was dominated by nature, to the full world, which is now dominated by humans. In the empty world, the limiting factors of human well-being, human well-being, were labor and infrastructure. In the full world, it is natural resources and environmental things. Being a policymaker and understanding that basic fact, it's essential. China did not close 2,000 companies around Beijing a few years ago because those companies were not profitable, because they were running out of resources, but because even the communist regime cannot ignore anymore the pressure which is coming from society due to the pollution which irresponsible use of the resources in those companies caused in the city of Beijing. These are the real movers today. And understanding that, and that's why I'm so happy that we are coming to the Green Deal, uh, which I will be more happier when I will see the substance, of course. But uh, if, I, if I would be asked, if you marry the political reality which we see today in France on the streets, which we see by the young generation, which is protesting, then I would basically say Green Deal slash intergenerational contract, because that's exactly what we need. We need to tell those people who do not understand who the unfairness of the situation in which they are trapped. And we have seriously in-depth it from the social and in particularly from the environmental point of view future generations, that we do understand that our generation is ready to respond. And that's why I firmly believe that this is the way to go. Finally, the role of uh, RTD and JRC in that respect, because I think I'm actually sometimes quite happy seeing but what, how the things are evolving. But I think you have a major opportunity because you are not one of those political portfolios which would be very much in the political radar in the Commission. So you can, you have the ability, strength through the JRC and through everything what you are doing in your research, you have the ability to set the, the direction. And, uh, and the, the fact that you are below political ra radar, actually on one hand giving you 
major opportunity, but on the other hand, also major responsibility where the Europe moves. So uh, that would be uh, my advice for you. And uh, basically, I think that uh, working more on that, uh, the gap will always exist. That's a uh, fact of life. But how we actually fill it uh, with uh, this understanding what are the needs of uh, all those uh, uh, who are integrated in this policy making, I think it's uh, essential. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Panelists usually don't get a clap, but that, that, I think that's exceptional. Um, Cecilia, from, I, I want to come to you because one of the points that uh, Yanis made was that, um, that Einstein said that politics uh, was a lot more complex than physics. But one of the key aspects of um, evidence-based policy is actually bringing the two together, is bringing researchers closer to policymakers. Um, from a national perspective, how do you how do you go about this? You know, what's what's your mechanism? How, how do you get them? How do you get them to talk to one another in a language that they both might understand? Uh, thank you, Connor. Uh, thank you for for this session. I think it's very interesting. Um, we do have some ex experience in Spain because, of course, we do think it's very important that um, policy is based on evidence. And, and like Fulvio said in his presentation, this is not new. I mean, this has been something that's been going on. Um, and, and it's, it's, um, it's a status quo in, in many cases. But I think the, the new issue right now is the fact that, that things have become more complex. And the information has become more complex and policy making is becoming more complex. So um, in Spain we have some examples that, that I think are, are, are nice to share. Um, one of the examples is we have is um, bringing together, we have a, um, a, a project that has to do with um, monitoring R&D and uh, it's a corpus viewer that brings together different data from patents, from projects, individual projects, from uh, research information, from publications and all this information are worked with uh, uh, data, data specialists and data scientists and they they analyze the data and they use natural language processing and the professionals working with the data. So they know what they're doing. And then on the other side we have the policymakers that want to design a national plan or national strategy and they have policy questions. So these two um, groups of people have, have worked together and have an interface which my foundation has worked together and helped um, help better understand the questions that the policymakers are wanting to define the strategy, to define the national plan, and what the data science we're working with. So here, policy is important, and policy definition is, is, uh, was complex, and, was, and the priorities, they knew what they wanted to ask. Data scientists knew how to work with the data. They knew what the algorithms and et cetera, but the interface was important. And I think here... Um, we learned a lot, the fact that it's important that the languages are different and it's, it's, you, need, you need that, you need that. Um, and another um, experiment or another project that we had, um, it was actually an initiative bun, done by civil society and it's uh, Science Meets Parliament. Although they're researchers, they were researchers that went to the parliament, that went to the Congress in, in Spain and, and we're one of the few countries that do, doesn't have an office of science and technology related, uh, associated to our parliament. Researchers went to the president of the parliament and said, why don't we um, make, have a decision-making process in, related to science? And here again, it was the whole issue of we wanted not policies for science, which basically is done at, a, at, at the executive later, level, at the ministries, et cetera, et cetera, but we wanted science um, for policy in all of the issues. So we organi the session was organized and they, they um, worked on different, different themes, artificial intelligence, migration, suicide, education, skills, very various uh, themes. And we brought, to get, brought together specialists, scientists who are specialists in those fields, the uh, members of parliament, which legislate in those areas. And then again, we had an interface. We trained 24 um, researchers, young researchers, to specifically learn the language of how policymakers work, how they think, what the, what's pressing their agenda, what's, how the, the, the members of parliament have to make decisions, and of course they understand the background of researchers. So again, it was, it's a new way of working and making that interface. So I think the challenge um, to, to, 
to take on what my previous uh, interventions uh, have been saying is that it's not a matter of uh, basing si a policy on evidence because I think we all agree on that. It's how we do it. I think, uh, I think that's the point, is how it, it's integrating into the process. And I think the integration is what's new. And I think we have to work on that integration. And I think we're talking about maybe a new profession or a new way, a new uh, way of understanding the process. And just like um, in the when science communication came around, are the journalists doing communication or are the researchers doing communication? Well, it's the same kind of thing. Are these data science giving information for policy or are these policies giving information on research? It's, 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 it's an interface, it's hard to understand and I think it's a new, it's a new area and at least in Spain we're, we're working on this and I think it's important and I think there, we have pilots that, that are working well and I think it's, it's something that we can share with the commission and, and see how it's been working for us in the def definition at least of our strategy and our national policies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecilia. I think that's a really, that latter point you made in terms of, um, in terms of how to, how to get that level of lines of communication open is really interesting. And it's a good, it, it's a good you know, th th this is one of the advantages of working together, that you get, you get really interesting examples from different countries that try different things and they work. And this, these are the type of things that can be taken up then by other countries and even at European level. Richard, um, one time we in Ireland thought we were the smallest, most isolated country in Europe. We were a little island out in the Atlantic. Um, but that pales in comparison to Malta, <laughs> which is a very isolated small island in the Mediterranean. And um, I, I, my question to you is, as, as, a, as a very small country, um, how do you see that you can get value out of evidence-based policy, you know, especially given your size in terms of data, in terms of being able to gather information and see how it, how it influences policy. Thank you, Conor. Um, it's a very inter interesting question. I will start off uh, to share with you a personal challenge th this morning, speaking the last speaker after s such a lustrous panel. So for me, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge, challenge to keep the audience in, t in, in, in the interesting. So, uh, we have, I mean, as you, you said, we are the smallest mem member state. We are an island member state, which complicates matters, and we're situated in the southern uh, border of Europe. So, that's, uh, it's, it's on its own uh, challenge. Um, as regards to evidence-based policy, it's, uh, it's a fact. It's, it's, it's not a question whether we want to go to evidence-based or, or, or otherwise, because the otherwise does not exist. Uh, the challenges we face are uh, normally related, related to a situation where um, uh, the notation that one size fits all does not apply uh, in the sense that data or, or information or results gathered from projects uh, coming uh, from other mem mem member states is not necessarily representative for the situation of Malta or, or other uh, regions living in the periphery of Europe. We, more, more often than not, encounter sit, sit, situations whereby there are projects, there are a number of member states taking part of those projects. They produce probably excellent re results, but those results cannot be transposed, cannot be linearly extrapolated, I'm using scientific term now, and into uh, into regions, into states, which were not part of the project. And that's a situation where evidence-based uh, becomes relevant for all those member states which obviously uh, participate in the project, but definitely not uh, to those member states, like more often than us, uh, which are not uh, situated on the uh, mainland. Uh, one other challenge that we face is the burden to produce the data, to fill questionnaires, to fill, because obviously the, our resources are small. And therefore, uh, in order to uh, fulfill the obligations of filling all the questionnaires, all the data, all the information, it's a, it's a burden on the, mem on the member, member states. We have to be uh, positive. And we are grateful, for example, to the program, the Policy Support Facility by Horizon 2020. Uh, we have taken, we are now starting the third 
project on Horizon 2020 uh, on open, open access. That I think it's the ideal way to help member states bridge the gap uh, in their, in their uh, policy, policy work. And this policy support for, for, for facility helps uh, the, the member states through tailor-made uh, initiatives. And that is di direct towards achieving policy which is relevant to Europe, but at the same time relevant to the particular member state. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. And in fact, <laughs> I must say that um, I, I've been involved in, in the policy support facility as, a, as an expert, and I think it's one of the real innovations in Horizon, in Horizon 2020. It was something that is a real value to member states, because often we think at European level, but this is a way you can get back, you can bring back expertise from Europe and focus it on a single country and on its particular situation. Now, I've been looking at the... Um, some of the questions coming up on Slido. And, um, and one of the points, and, and, and I want to address this to Fulvio, is that um, the, there's a question about trust and about evidence. And one of the points you made was that, um, that, that robustness of data. But we have, a, we have a real global problem, and it's not just a European one, on the ability of people to believe the data in the first place. If, if some people don't like something, they call it fake. How do you, I mean, if you, if you take, for example, we know that vaccination works. We know that it has eradicated many diseases. I mean, that's, that's a fact. Yet, and yet, we have so many people who refuse to have their children vaccinated. Again, in the face of evidence. How do you work towards addressing that challenge? Well, <coughs> Connor, uh, I was mentioning, uh, we, uh, the, the scientific community, we uh, qualify the data often on the basis of where the data have been published. So if you find a report in a very prestigious journal saying that there is a correlation between vaccination and autism, then you generate an effect in the public opinion, which is uh, a disaster. And, and I think this was at, at the origin of the sort of avalanche effect uh, in, the, in the internet about the uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, fight against vaccine. And, and then uh, I, uh, all the scientific community mobilized on, on solid data showing uh, the, the importance of vaccine and so on. But then to really win the battle is, is difficult. Uh, in my country, in Italy, uh, the Minister of Health had to, to produce an act obliging, again, the people to vaccine the children and not admitting to schools the, the unvaccinated children. But you, you, you imagine all the energy, the energy that was spent just on the basis of data which were then disproved. So uh, it is a, a big responsibility on the shoulders of the scientific community. I think uh, actually on, on, on that point, I'll just give you one example from an Irish perspective. We had a very low uptake in the HPV vaccine, the one which causes cervical cancer in women. And the most effective thing that turned that around was a young woman in her 20s who had a terminal diagnosis for cervical cancer and who went on social media and on television and said to people, if I had taken that vaccine, I will be alive. I'm going to die. And she kept herself going up to the very end. And the uptake on the vaccine rocketed up again. So it was, I think it was a good example of where citizens acting can really play a significant role in the area of how you change public opinion and indeed evidence-based evidence-based policy. 
I've got one at the top. Um, we, we've had, um, we, we, I've been just watching the, the thing pop up and down. And, um, but what I would like to do is, I, I, I think we've, I'm sure we have some questions sitting in here in the audience, people who'd like to ask some questions. Can we get a hand, two? Or is everybody using Slido? I see one hand right up the back there. Can we get a microphone there, please? I'd, I'd like to ask the panellists uh, for their definition of science. Uh, to me, this is very much coming from a STEM orientation. And uh, I think, Connor, at the outset, you mentioned qualitative and quantitative information sources. I think there's very much an evidence um, or a dependence on quantitative data from, from the panel here. So we'd just like some comment on that. Thank you. Who would like to take that? So, Cecilia? Yeah, I mean, yes, um, obviously, we, um, qualitative data, quantitative data, it's not just the STEM. I mean, it's, it's all type of information. I mean, in general, the word information will include both those, both those types of things. I mean, data encompasses statistics, encompasses information, encompasses surveys, encompasses um, administrative data. So, so, yes, maybe perhaps we simplified it and, and we're talking about just one area, but... Um, in general, uh, I think all of us um, refer to information in general and how it's used uh, to feed into the, into the policy. So. Thank you. And I think, I mean, I, I used, please go ahead, I'll just say, go ahead, Fulvio. Not Connor. Oh, sorry, Yannick. No, if I can just um, a bit connect those things and uh, one provocative thought uh, at the end. Um, Trust, I think, it's not the major problem of scientists because if you go to opinion pools, they are more trusted than practically everybody else. But uh, I think simple conclusion is people are strange. So when, for example, when you, when you take medicine, you immediately read all the side effects and I would guess that quite a number of people stop eating medicine because of the side effects, even if it's clear that any medicine has side effects. But yeah, we, we, we have a fear always, and this is always difficult. So the whole politics today is manipulating people and uh, integrating the fear in our logic and so on. So uh, the provocative thought which I wanted to share with you, it's, um, and it, it goes a bit with this uh, data and future, how we could better address the policy making. So priority of the Commission is healthy planet, digital world, fine. And uh, we all know that uh, the major problem is actually defining the safe operating space because we have the inner circle with human needs which is growing and we have the outer circle of the planetary boundaries which is unfortunately not growing, it's there where it is. So this space is actually shrinking and uh, the problem which, uh, which is actually proven in the past is that policy makers were not able to efficiently address from various kinds of the reasons uh, that we would uh, fundamentally live in the safe operating space. But uh, now the artificial intelligence is coming. What if we would give the artificial intelligence the task to define safe operating space, which would actually limit the politicians? Uh, I know that this is quite risky, that a gang would be abused like everything was uh, in uh, all the stories which you have heard with Cambridge Analytica and so on. But of course, all those things need to be regulated. I'm just provocative because I think that the way how we are currently functioning it simply will simply deliver really the, the real answers where we will face some catastrophes or some unbearable conditions. And that's why we are currently reacting more than we reacted in the past because we see that the world is really changing in front of our eyes. And uh, one final thought, uh, what I would really once like to listen among the scientific community, since I'm now also the partner in one of these consultancy companies. And you know, those consultancy companies are pretty impactful. And, uh, but the production of knowledge is actually different. Uh, they are, science is in a way slower, less attractive, not really very knowledgeable how to approach and present the findings, but it is peer reviewed, it is exact, it is precise. How to combine those two worlds? Because, in essence, they are constantly interacting in, in real terms. And I think it would be one really good debate uh, which, if one would organize how to take the best of each of the community 
because now when I'm sitting also in the other community, I, I know that they are dealing seriously. They are serious guys, and, uh, but uh, absolutely they do not go so deep and they are always under the time pressure and so on. But time pressure is also something which is close to uh, policy decision makers. So I think it would be really once good to have a kind of a debate how to combine the, the best of the two words, uh, not to undermine any of, of, uh, of the brilliant minds in the scientific community, on the contrary, just to see how it's the best way to impact and to make the real change in policy in, 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 and in the society. Thank you very much, Janitz. You're talking about time pressure. We've got time pressure because we, we, we need to finish our, our event to allow for the impact awards to begin. I would like to give the panel, each member, 30 seconds. And I say 30 seconds. If there's any last messages they would like to give to, to, our, to our audience here in the room and indeed those online. Oh. Um, I can well, we can pick whoever wants to volunteer to go first. I, I, I see there's so many interesting questions that I can't really answer them all. But I think the important thing is I think there's, there's a need for interface. I think there's a, a role, a new role here between all the information, the rich information that's being generated, that's being made by the scientists, that it's quality, that's rigor, that's, that's uh, excellence, and the, the needs of the policymakers. So that interface is, I think there's a new need there and there's, a, there's an opportunity. So I would say that, that that's a a new profession. <laughs> Thanks, uh, thank you, Cecilia. Richard. So uh, from my end, I would say there is need for improved communication between the scientific world and the policy world. So the language the scientist uh, speaks, they're mostly uh, very complicated high level language because obviously they work in a high, high level scientific field. But then when it comes to policy, there is need for an interface, a translation, between the high-level scientific knowledge into uh, the um, terms which the policymaker under, uh, understands. And also, besides the communications, the timing. Because when a project finishes, uh, this, the, the results will take almost a little bit like long time until they get into, into the policy. Thank you. Anna. Well, I think that... Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. I think that this framework program gives us the opportunity to make the difference and make the next step. So strategic planning is the framework where we can build trust and we can work together with citizens and policy makers to define the priorities. Missions can provide concrete impact. So I think that the best thing for us now is to take the opportunity to work together to increase trust and to deliver what we expected to deliver after five, six Yes, time. Thank you. Yanis. Trans Transition to a more sustainable world, it's inevitable. That's more or less understood. The urgency, it's not understood. But if we will not shift from a prevailing short-term logic and focus in our policy making, if we will not address the question of the consumerism, which is fueled by quantity-driven profits and growth measured by GDP, if we will not make the transition just fair and inclusive, we will not succeed. So focus on that. Thank you. Fulvio. Well, I think it's really important to bridge these two communities, to make them to talk intensively to each other. Uh, and I... I, I I hope that, that this new uh, instrument uh, that we have in the, in the next uh, framework program, the missions, could be the ideal perimeter within which this bridge could be constituted. And I think that set, well, a, a limited number of uh, major challenges uh, have been identified but I think that across all of them, the, tem the, 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 the theme of uh, human well-being uh, and uh, human uh, sustainable well-being is the crucial one, and, and it should inform, I think, the whole framework program. Thank you very much. 
Um, my only regret is that we don't have another hour to continue the discussion, as I'm sure we have lots of things to explore. But at this point, I would like you to put your hands together for the panellists, who I think have been wonderful, who have provided really excellent responses and input into this debate. Thank you. And also, I'd just like to point out that while all your questions weren't answered, the Slido app, the information contained in that will be taken up by the Commission in their consideration. So it's not, so the questions, even though they weren't answered in detail, will be taken on board. So thank you very much. And remember, the Impact Awards comes next. Thank you very much.